its teaching is too hard. Who can listen to it? Let's pray together. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, when you make these proclamations of who you are, Lord, they are difficult for us to hear. Sometimes difficult for us to understand the things of the Lord. So we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would give us wisdom and insight so that we might believe and receive eternal life through you. We pray this in Christ's name and all God's people said, amen. Most of Jesus' claims in many ways are outrageous. We've been talking about this in the last few weeks where Jesus says, before Abraham existed, I am. And he uses that very name of the same that Moses, when he met uh, God in the burning bush, the I am who I am or the great I am. And Jesus' claim that he is God in the flesh is an outrageous claim. The other claim where he makes that before, when he says before Abraham, I existed, he also says that if you do not believe that I am he or I am the great I am, then you will die in your sin. Those claims are outrageous claims, but then there are other times where Jesus uses this term, this I am, I am, and they don't seem so outrageous. I am, I am the vine, or I am, I am the gate. He uses the very name of God in describing himself, but then attaches that to certain metaphorical statements. And they don't seem that outrageous until you tie them into what he then says after about these claims. Like, I am the bread of life, and he who comes to me will never go hungry. Or, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Or, I am the good shepherd, the one who lays down his life for his sheep. Or, I am the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me will never die. Or, I am the true vine, apart from me, you can do nothing. Or I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. Right? Outrageous for a person to make these claims. If Jesus is not God in the flesh, if he is not divine, these are blasphemous claims. And so we have a question to make. What is it that Jesus is saying by these? Can I really believe the things that he says? And if he is who he says he is, then what difference does that make in my life? And then therefore, what does Jesus want us to do with that? My hope is as we become understanding Christ in a better way, as we begin to understand who he is, my hope is that we would worship him greater because we would understand that he is God in the flesh, but also that we might proclaim him to others. That he is not just a prophet, that he is not just a good teacher, but that he is God in the flesh, and that line is drawn by him. That is very true of the statement that he makes today. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. That is today's claim. And it's not just a political statement. It's not just a statement like, hey, Jesus is a pretty good guy. Believe in him. That's not the statement he's making. And it's not a statement like, hey, if you come and you vote for me, I'll make sure that there's a chicken in every pot and a car in every driveway. They didn't have cars back then, by the way. So maybe a donkey in every stall. That's not what he's doing here. He's not not concerned with the political situation that's happening at the time. It's not that. Because if it was, Jesus would say, hey, I am the 10-ounce T-bone steak of life. But he says, no, I am the bread of life because there is something essential to this idea behind being the bread of life. See, this statement that Jesus makes is directly tied to the miracle that he just performed. If you know this story, Jesus has just fed 5,000 men and women and children are there. So the the number is larger than 5,000. He has just taken a few loaves and a few fish and he has prayed and he has supplied and everyone that day ate and was satisfied. That's the miracle. And as they're satisfied, there are leftovers. God has provided leftovers, right? There's, there's others here who could continue to eat because our God is not a God of scarcity, but he is a God of surplus. And so that has just occurred. What happens after that miracle is Jesus sends his disciples in a boat and he sends them across the Lake of Galilee. 
And while they're going across the lake, Jesus doesn't go with them. But somewhere in the middle of the night, they see a figure walking across the lake. You know this story. Some of you have been to Sunday school? Peter is like, hey, I want to get out of the boat. I want to come see you. And so that's what occurs. That's what happens at night. And then after Jesus pulls Peter from almost drowning, they get in the boat and they make it to the other side of the lake. When the crowd realizes that Jesus is not there, and they also realize that Jesus didn't go in a boat, he didn't go with his disciples, they're like, well, where is he? When they find him on the other side of the lake, they have a question for him. How did you get here? Rabbi, they say, this is in John uh, 6, 25. Rabbi, how did you get here? Or how did you do that? How did you get to the other side without coming in a boat? And Jesus doesn't give them the answer. Right? His disciples know, but he doesn't give the crowd the answer. He says, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, not because you saw me feed like, like split up the bread and the loaves. That's not why you're searching for me but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. You're searching for me because you got full tummies now. Do not work for food that spoils, he says, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of God will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Jesus is saying, the reason you've come and looked for me is because I gave you a free lunch. Free lunch draws a crowd, right? We're Baptists. We know how free lunch draws a crowd. <laughs> I mean, churches are built on free lunches. But so Jesus is saying, look, you liked the product that God gave you, a full belly. But that's not what you should be looking for. right? This is the prosperity gospel. This is the, the idea behind Hey, I come to God because he gives me the things that I want. And if God doesn't happen to work out for me, or maybe, hey, I prayed to Jesus and I didn't get the thing that I wanted, and so now I have nothing to do with him. I only want a God who does good things for me and gives me good things. And when that ha doesn't happen, guess what happens? People fall away from the faith. Why? Because they expect God to be a pop machine. I put in my coins, I pray to him, I push the button, and I get what I want. If that's your faith, then you have no faith. Because this is exactly what Jesus says. is like, you guys are coming after me because you want me to fulfill your bellies and you want me to drive out the Romans. And so much so that when Jesus does the, the 5,000, when he feeds them, they want to make him king because they realize, hey, look, if he can feed us, he's going to be able to do other miracles for us. And they knew in the Old Testament that the Messiah was going to be the one who came to feed but he's not just coming to feed them for their belly's sake. There's something more here that he is going to provide. And so this back and forth continues, right? He says, he says, you must receive food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. So now comes the question, right? It almost seems like a good question. Well, what must we do? What is it that God requires us to do to receive this, they say in verse 28? What must we do to do the work God requires? This seems like a very good question, doesn't it? But this is the same trap that we always fall into, whether it's the Good Samaritan trap with that parable, or it's the same trap that we fall into with the rich young ruler. What must I do? How do I get to heaven? That's the question. Jesus responds to them by not specifically answering their question because the question is wrong. It's the question we always ask. What good works do I have to do to get to heaven? How many times do I have to pray? How many, how many alms do I have to give? How often, right? It's, it's all about works. It's all about works. Jesus responds. Listen to this. It's the gospel. The work of God is this, to believe in the one that he has sent. To believe, believe, faith. To believe in the one who does the work, not your works, his works on the cross for your salvation. And so this is where it draws it out. It's not about getting your belly filled. It's not about all the good things you can do because the gospel is based on this. Your salvation is by God's grace through faith. It's believing in the one that he sent. Not by works. It's a gift from God so that none of you can boast about it. The only one we boast about is Christ. We boast about Christ's work on the cross. It's what Christ did. It's always about Jesus, right? And so Jesus is trying to get them to see this. It's not about what you do. It's about what he does. 
And so we are to believe in the one that God has sent, right? You can't do anything. What you have to do is you have to believe. And then they ask, well, why should we believe in you? Prove it to us. Hey, Jesus, dance for us. Do another miracle for us. They just saw him feed 5,000 people or more, and they're asking for another miracle. They're like, look, Moses gave us manna from heaven. What are you going to give us? Give us more. Give us more. Give us more. Does this sound like us? We do the same thing. God, you know, you might have proven yourself one point, but give me more. Give me more. And so they're asking for more, and Jesus corrects them very clearly. He says, I tell you the truth. It's not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven. Who gives the bread from heaven? It's the Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. Right? The manna, they eat and they die. But now there is a true bread that if you eat, you will live. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. That is the true bread of life, is the one whose body is broken for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. To repair the relationship between you and God. That he would take the wrath of God. So then, in verse 34, it almost seems like they get it. They're like, well, give us this bread. Give it to us. We want this. Once again, they seem to be on track with him. And so then this is where Jesus pushes the button. He uses that term again. I am, I am. Ego, a me in Greek. Right? The I am, the great I am. He uses the very name of God here. I am, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. They don't believe. They see him, but they don't believe he is who he says he is. They're like, well, aren't you Joseph and Mary's boy? Like, we know where you came from, and yet you're claiming to be from heaven? Right? The Jews grumble, it says. When he says, I am the bread of life, all of a sudden it becomes this outrageous claim. We might ask ourselves, why is it that Jesus chooses the, the image of the bread, the bread of life? And the point here Jesus is saying is, bread is essential for life. And what he's saying to them is I am essential for you to live. Not just physical, but spiritual life. And he is essential, just the same way bread is essential. We cover up bread in many ways. We make cupcakes and pancakes, and sometimes we put bread in between the two pieces. And, but the essential part is there is bread. We need the bread to live. And the key point what Jesus is saying to them is I am essential to your life right? You can't live without me. Everything that bread represents for us as humans, sustenance, comfort, identity, relationship, goodness, as we gather around, Jesus says, I am all of these things. In our world, our world is consumed by a consumer sort of identity. The uh, CEO for Amazon, Jeff Bezos, some of you might know who he is. Maybe you get some of these packages on your front step. They asked him one day, what is it that really helped you build your company? He said, I found the answer was that I take the, the infinite need of people and I supply them with finite products as quickly as they can possibly get it. Hey, I want something. Oh, it's going to be here tomorrow. We all do it because we have a hole. Those things don't satisfy, do they? You know how you know? Because you have a garage sale four years later and you're like, man, I wish I had all the money back that I spent on these items that I'm trying to sell at this garage sale, right? And so Jesus is saying, I am the one who satisfies. I am the one who is essential for your life. That's exactly what he's teaching them here. And it's not just that, but the bread that is consumed. Have you ever thought about it? Why does God make it so that you have to eat? and eat on a regular basis. It's not because it's only fuel, even though it is fuel, but every time we eat, we are put in a place of submission because it's actually God who provides us something to eat, right? We might plant the seed, but it's God who makes it grow. The sun, the rain, all of that from him. And so as Christians, we pray before we eat and we thank God for the food that we have. 
And so once again, we're in a place where we are dependent upon him. And every time we eat, we are supposed to be reminded of that. Every time we have bread, we are to be reminded that there is one who satisfies, who is the bread from heaven, the one who supplies our need, not only physically so that we have our bellies full, but God also supplies our spiritual need, right? What is that spiritual need? The bread from heaven who comes down, who dies on the cross for your sin. That's exactly what we are to be reminded of. And every time we have communion, again, we are reminded of this. But then it even gets more difficult because Jesus pushes it further. It's not only about houses and cars and dinners out and getting more and more possessions, but Jesus pushes it a little further. The Jews, they begin to grumble sharply among them. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? How is that possible? How is it possible that he is all of these things? And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's an outrageous claim. Like, can you imagine if I stood here and said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you won't live. There's no eternal life in you. Can you imagine that statement? That's an outrageous claim. Jesus doesn't give you an option here. You have to either believe the words that he says to be true, or maybe he's not who he says he is and he's insane. And so here it comes. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate the manna and died. But he who feeds on this bread, his body, will live forever. And so then the crowd at Capernaum that day, he teaches this while in the synagogue, many of his disciples at this point decide to leave. And they say, this teaching is too hard for us. Because they don't understand what he's saying. The resurrection hasn't happened yet. His death on the cross hasn't taken place. They don't understand what's going on, but it's the same question. Because Jesus' claim here demands a response from us. And here's the question. Is he from heaven as he claims to be from heaven? Right? Is he sent from God? Is he the great I am who satisfies your life or isn't he? Is he God in the flesh? Is he the name that he calls himself? And then the question is, how do I eat his body and drink his blood? Because this is how we receive eternal life. We want to have a list of things that we can do to get us to heaven. Because we're much more comfortable with that. But the reality, what Jesus is saying, he says, that won't get you in. You're not admitted by the things that you've done. You need him. You need Jesus. Your eternal life needs him. It's not about possessions. You must possess only one, and that is Christ. So then he says to Simon Peter and the other 12, he says, do you guys want to leave too? All the other disciples are leaving. Do you want to leave? And Peter, you got to love Peter, says this, verse 68 and 69, Lord, who shall we go to? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know, right? We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter hears the claim of Jesus that he is God in the flesh and he believes and he knows it to be true. He sees the miracles and he knows that he's from God because who else could do that? Logically, think about it. Who could do the miracles of Christ if they're not from God? If God did not send him to do the work that he claims that he has sent. And who else is essential for your life but Christ? There's a gentleman by the name of Dr. Clive Calver, who's the president of World Relief, which is a missionary organization that goes and helps people who are in need all over the world. He tells a story where one day he's in Africa and there's this woman who is blind, who is on the um, side of the road begging. Her husband is mentally impaired and he can't work. And she's looking after one of her granddaughters because her own daughter has died of AIDS. 
the baby is probably infected as well. Clive's wife, Ruth, encounters her on the street one day, and on that day, this woman's name is Rhoda. She's had her clay water jar stolen from her. She's blind. She doesn't know who took it. And Clive and his wife, Ruth, even though they're missionaries, are coming back to the United States the next day. And so they want to help, but they also ask her this question, what is it that we should tell the people in the West? What should we let them know? What would you have them say? She said, you know, you can tell them something. I would like them to know something very important. I want to pass along this message, she says. Let them know that I'm doing well, that I'm fine here. Please tell my brothers and sisters in Christ that I have everything I could ever have or ever need because I have Jesus. How many things do you need in life before you're satisfied? How many things are you going to keep asking God for when he's already given you the thing that matters more than anything else? God, I, if you make me famous, then I'll tell others about you because I'll have a bigger audience. The audience isn't for you. We point to Christ. Oh God, if I was wealthy, then I would tithe more. We don't tithe now. What makes us think we're going to do it when we have more? God, if you do such and such for me, then I will do that for you. It doesn't work that way. Never has. Oh, I asked for God and he didn't supply my need. He didn't do the thing that I wanted him to do. Like he's a genie. Like I'm going to rub the bottle and then he's going to come out and do all the things that I want. It doesn't work that way. God does not care for your happiness as much as he cares about your holiness. He wants you to know that one thing satisfies in this life, and that is the one who is sent from heaven, the body of Christ, God in the flesh, the very word who became flesh, who now you receive the words of eternal life from. It is him who satisfies. It is him who matters. There is no one else that matters but him. So if you've come to Jesus, the question is, why have I come? If you've never come to Jesus, come to Jesus for Jesus, not for the products that God has given you. If I'm only coming because he fulfills my belly, I've come for the wrong reason. If the only reason I come to Jesus is because I think he can save me from hell, Christians, I haven't come to Jesus. I've only come to Jesus because I fear hell. Ask yourself this question. If Jesus wasn't going to save you from eternal damnation, would you love him? If Jesus did not promise you eternal life, would you still love him? Or do you only love him because he gives you things? Because that's the true examination. Is it Jesus who satisfies? Is it him who is magnified? Is it him who is above all other things? Or are other things more important? Am I more concerned about having money and fame? Am I going after the prosperity gospel? Or if, what, if, what if I was asked, like those first century Christians, to go and die in the lion-feeding Colosseum of Rome? Would I still love Christ? Or do I only love him because he gives me good things? It's Jesus and all Jesus. He is the only thing that satisfies and he is the only one that matters. He is the one who is essential to your life because he is the one who gives you all of the things that you need, which is him. He is the one who's come from heaven who will satisfy that hole in your heart. He satisfies all of those things because he is God Almighty who came to this earth for you. He loves you. Never forget that. It's all about the relationship. He loves you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are humbled by your glory and how you sent your son Jesus Christ to provide for us. 
He is the true bread from heaven who gives us life and life eternal because, Lord, you are great and awesome. But, Lord, may we love you for who you are and not for the things that you give us. The same way that we love others in our life because of who they are, not because they do good things for us. Lord, take this selfishness away from us and recognize that it's only by Christ and what he has done that we even know what love is. Teach us to love you deeply as you have loved us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.